Hi students, welcome to the Baiju Sindhu News Analysis for 9th of September 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article says Menaka Gandhi bypassed nutrition norms cleared. So what is the context that we are speaking about? It says that Niti Aayog has approved the supplementary nutrition guidelines prepared by some of the officials of the Ministry for Women and Child Development bypassing Minister for Women and Child Development that is Menaka Gandhi following certain interventions from the Prime Minister's office so what is this whole context speaking about so what it says is that there were certain differences between minister that is here whom we have is the menaka gandhi and then certain officials within the ministry and what was it about it was about certain things with respect to the integrated child developmental scheme so what are the basic differences that they have let's look into and try and understand what were the basic differences and how was this sorted by the intervention of niti aayog along with the prime minister's office so some of the differences that the ministry officials as well as menaka gandhi had was taking home the ration so what menaka gandhi basically believed was that this has to be sourced from anganwadis with manufacturing facilities or through government or through private undertakings so what she basically did was that she wanted these rations to be outsourced that is from the manufacturing center or through the private entities or through any of these manufacturing hubs it was supposed to be dispatched to the people that is what she said so in case there is ration hubs all these rations that the people are collecting they would be able to collect from any of these centers which would be provided certain certifications but what did the ministry official say so they said that procurement for the take home ration should be only done through the self help groups so there was a major conflict between these two groups right one which is headed by menaka gandhi the other one with reference to certain officials and what menaka gandhi also said was that these meals should be presented in the form of ready to eat mixes as anganwadi workers steal the money provided for procuring certain raw materials what she said was that there are certain ready to eat mixes which is provided in the form of a packet and these things should be directly provided to the people why because there is corruption because there are people who are misutilizing all these funds in the form of providing food to the people this is what menaka gandhi said but what did the official said so they laid emphasis on local procurement for hot cooked meals instead of ready to eat mixes so what they said was instead of providing these packaged food that is already existing what we should be providing them is the immediate food which is cooked and immediately has to be provided for the people why it is because hot and hot and prepared food is good for the health but the packaged food that would have been given to these children or to the people would not be good for the health that is what the ministry official said and finally what menaka gandhi said was that it she also recommended soya milk but what the official said was that they were not recommending the soya milk so because of all these differences with respect to these dimensions the niti aayog as well as the prime minister's office had to step in and they had to go with the recommendations of the ministry officials so these are the things that have been sorted and now what will happen is the implementation bit and this implementation bit will be in the form of assigning all these tasks as per the ministry officials recommendations so what are the various concerns one of the concerns that we need to understand with respect to these thing is that this debate continues to happen how is that we are going to implement this process what are the ways that we are going to take up what are the steps that we are going to follow with respect to the implementation time after time what we see is that implementation is become a major problem for all the government now we have the india government so there will be certain tussles with respect to the ministry as well as with the officials then we will have next is the let's say for example in the future we have the congress government coming in again there will be implementational flaws so major problem what we see is that the implementation of all these is programs have been haunting the government time and again so why is it because of it it is because of the lack of evidences it is because of the lack of data because of all the lacune in the implementation is because there is lack of data that the government lacks so in case the government is able to provide and the government is provided certain data then we would be able to implement this models is what is being talked about because we do not have a clear cut idea of the number of people who need to be fed with what is the quality of the 
food that needs to be provided what is the type of food that needs to be provided and what people think about all this so these are certain deficient areas or the lacuna areas so how is that we are providing all this for this what we need is the data or what we need is the statistics for which we will have to apply one of the important and most important is called as the evidence based approach and this evidence based approach is one of the most important policy in the public policy so what we will be discussing right now is the evidence based approach in the policy making this needs to be implemented for all the future schemes so that there is no confusion there is no dilemma and there is no alternative process to this particular scientific process so for which what we need to understand is what is this evidence based policy making one of the things that we need to understand with respect to this article is because we do not have data there is problem with the project implementation and the solution to all this is the evidence based policy making so how are we implementing this and that is by the evidence so what are these evidences let's say for example an evidence is nothing but a scientific process it is a paradigm it is a model or we have certain statistics with us we have certain recommendation survey exercise is experiments all these things are being conducted rationally scientifically with respect to certain statistics so the first important point that we need to consider is we need to have certain statistics and all these statistics are on the basis of experiments that have been conducted scientifically so when we have all these statistics or the data or the experiments or the survey that is conducted rationally scientifically and then collection of all these statistics according to norms such evidences when we are taking it up and then using these facts to implement a particular process is called as the evidence based model so what happens in this particular case is regardless of the government let's say for example now we have the nda regime which is headed by the bjp next we will have the congress regime which will be headed by the congress so what will happen in this particular case is irrespective of the political ideology irrespective of the political party that is there in picture what we would be able to do is we would be able to implement a model we would be able to implement a particular policy or a program why that is because we have statistics and why because this statistics that we have collected is in a scientific basis so today bjp cannot say that this is some flaw program tomorrow congress will come and it cannot say that this is something confusing no why because of these statistics and these statistics because they have a rational basis behind it because of all these things the program will be able to be implemented in a rational basis why because there is statistics and data with us so irrespective of all the political ideologies irrespective of which party is in power all these statistics can be used and it can be implemented in north south east west any of the states for example let's say for example there is something called as the kerala model or let's say for example there is Karnataka model or Gujarat model for that matter irrespective of whichever party is there in power because we have certain rational basis to understand how it is work what we will be doing is we will be implementing this particular program and that is what is called as the evidence based policy making so there are certain methodologies that we need to understand so what are these methodologies let's say for example we have collected all the statistics we have collected all the data so what we need to do is we need to understand and that this has to be implemented so what is the major thing so the major thing is the impact so what will be the major impact of this particular problem so in case this statistics in case this data is used what is the impact that is the first thing that we need to understand so is the impact going to be a good one is the impact going to be a bad one if it is good one how is that we will be able to approach this and how is that we would be able to transform it to other regions so that needs to be considered so what are the direct effects what are the indirect effects what if this particular program is not implemented if this program is not implemented what would be the problems to the people all these things will have to be understood 
even before we understand even before we implement this particular program so a major thing is along with the statistics and the data that we have what we also need to understand is the impact and the impact is in terms of the outcome how is it going to be good for the people how is it going to be bad for the people and how is that this will be able to spread major problems and address all these problems in terms of the implementation is what the methodology is all about and the next important problem is that there are certain challenges one of the major challenges with respect to these evidence-based policy making is that we do not have the research people so for all this you need people who are very advanced you need high quality researchers where do you get these researchers from is certain types of things that we need to understand one of the major things is that we need to make sure that these high quality researchers that are currently not available to perform all these rational data collection should be made sure that we have them so the first important point in terms of the challenges is that the researchers that we currently lack these people will have to be molded so that they collect all the statistics they collect all the data so that we would be able to provide certain evidence-based policy making and apart from this what we need is the political will so what happens off late is if there is a very good model or if there is a very good application of this particular policy there is not much of implementation why because let's say for example there is a left government in Kerala let's say for example there is Congress in Karnataka or let's say for example there is Madhya Pradesh government which is headed by BJP so whatever model if it is worked in Kerala why not apply the same in Madhya Pradesh if it is worked in Gujarat why not apply the same in some other Congress rule state because the problem is the political will it is the political ideology so politicians will have to move beyond all these ideologies and what they need to look at is the implementation bit and the outcome if it is good it is going to change the fortunes of the people leaving aside all these political will and the ideologies the people will have to implement these things so what are the major challenges one we need to make sure that there are few researchers who are there and who know how to understand it rationally and then when we have the policy and when we have the recommendation you need the political will to enforce the same thing so these are some of the things that we need to understand with respect to this area so this is all we will have to understand from this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says 25% of all accidental deaths in India are weather related so what is this article all about so this will be one of the important articles with respect to GS3 and that is with respect to the disaster management so this is basically with respect to certain understanding there is not much of analysis we will have to understand only the statistical data so what this article goes on to say is that weather related deaths are on the rise globally and figures in India stand at a staggering 25% and this was noted in a study that was conducted across the country from 2001 to 2014 by a research based organization called as population council so kindly remember this particular survey that was done by population council so what it has given is it has provided one of the reports which is titled extreme weather event induced deaths in India in 2001 to 2014 trends and differentials by the region sex and age group so it has published this one of the reports and it has come up with certain important documentation and evidences so what it has said is when we consider the certain statistics what it goes on to say is that this study all found that there are higher number of males who died due to extreme weather events than the females across all regions as well as in the year type pattern accordingly what it has also said is that most deaths reported were due to the lightning so this can be a prospective and a likely question from the prelims perspective first point that we need to remember is it is the males who are actually more impacted rather than the female why because it is the males in India who go outside to work rather than the females comparatively so the first point is male deaths are more in the natural circumstances and than the females and the next important point is that all these deaths are majorly towards lightning this is followed by extreme precipitation and then heat wave followed by cold wave so the second important point from the prelims perspective is that what are the 
deaths that have caused due to lightning as well as extreme precipitation as well as heat wave as well as cold wave and the third important point that we need to consider is a higher proportion of individuals who were 60 years or older died due to cold as well as heat waves than those in the younger groups so these are the three important points that we need to consider according to this report and what are the most important regions that we will have to consider what it says is the burden of death was the highest in central india and this was followed by andhra pradesh bihar uttar pradesh maharashtra and west bengal which were affected by the most of the extreme events so kindly remember all these things when it comes to the statistics but we will also consider the important losses so what it goes on to say is because of the losses that we have seen because of all these pro weather related programs what has happened is there is loss of human lives which can have an impact both on the macro at the micro level so what happens at the micro level so when we look at what happens at the micro level let's say for example there is one of the breadwinner and this is the only person who goes out to work so he'll be taking care of his entire family he'll have his parents he'll have his kids as well as wife imagine if this particular person actually passes away so what is the problem so he is the only breadwinner in this particular family so the family will face a lot of psychological impact one is in terms of the distress that is emotional the other one is in terms of economical how because he is the only one who works for the family and now because he is passed away because of this disaster what can impact is the psychological as well as the economical and at the same time what it further goes on to say is that there is also a macro level program so when it speaks about the macro level what it says is imagine the demographic dividend what do we mean by demographic dividend those people who are employable and who would be able to extract the economy out of them so these people in case of a particular age if these people are also are under the deathbed what can result is the decline in the economy so these are the major problem one at the micro level which is with the immediate family and then at the macro level which means towards the economy if the major number of people who are suffering are people who are employable then this could be a problem to the economy is what this article goes about speaking about but what is the challenges so when we look into the challenges what we know is the fact that india is a land of diversity we have different terrains we have different diversities different weather conditions so how is that the government in spite of all these challenges that is the extent of damage diversity and distribution of extreme events and the size of the population how is that the government would be able to overcome all these issues is some of the challenges that the government needs to address so this is all we will have to understand with respect to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says another member of my Manipur's banned terror outfit arrested. So what is that we are speaking about? So we are speaking about the banned terrorist outfit that is Kenglai Park Communist Party. So we know for the fact this is one of the important topics from the GS paper 3 and that is in the security. So what are these? So this is the problem with the security security that is the internal security problem and one of the most important is the insurgency groups in the northeast and one of the important insurgency groups in the northeast is the Kenglai Park Communities Communist Party and this is housed in Manipur so the most important point from the prelims perspective is where is this Kenglai Park Communist Party located and which part is it disturbing the peace in and that is in Manipur so this becomes a very important point so what does this King Lung Park community stands for? So basically when we look into their basic objective, what they are focused right now is that they want to actually move away from India that is its demands are for succession of Manipur from India so what it wants to do is that is why it is named this as the Kengla Park so what is Kengla Park here it is one of the earlier names of Manipur so what it says is that India has forcefully taken over Manipur and what it wants to do is it wants to restore the independence for the region of Manipur so one of the basic objectives of this particular group is it is 
is fighting for the independence of Manipur. What it says is that India has taken over it by force and that is why we want to make sure that we are moving away from India and we want to restore the independence of the erstwhile Manipur kingdom and for which we will fight tooth and nail is what this terror outfit has been telling. And what are its objectives is and after seeking the independence what it wants to make sure is it wants to make sure that there is egalitarian society which is basically believing on the principle of equality and what it further goes on to say is it liberates India from the it liberates Manipur from the Indian rule and basically wants to bring in a culture of Manipur that is all the culture that was there within this Manipur kingdom earlier even before it became a part of India so this culture will be reinstated so the indigenous culture within the Manipur will be promoted is what this particular Kenglai Communist Party going to speak about and the next important point that we need to consider is the funding aspect so what is important in this particular case is how is that these associations or these organizations get the funding recently when we discussed about the Maoist structure how exactly it functions we did discuss about the extortion rockets so all these organizations basically get their money and the funding for their organization through the extortion rockets or through the killing and they also get it by certain kidnapping so the three important points that we consider is extortion rocket killing as well as the kidnapping part apart from this what we also need to consider is what is its relations with the other groups so we did discuss that they have one of the important ideologies of communist party that is it names itself as the Kanglia communist party so it has close affiliations with the CPIM Maoist as well and apart from this it also has certain relationship with the Nepal Maoist group so basically what they want to do is they want to overthrow the elected government government and they want to bring about this particular reinstation of the indigenous culture that was existing before independence and for which it is fighting against the elected democratic government of India. So what these are some of the things as to with respect to the Kangli Park Communist Party. But what we also need to consider is this is one of the groups in Manipur. There are also other groups that we need to consider. So what are the other groups that are there in Manipur is the next important question. So there is also another group called as the People's Liberation Army. So this is one of the other important groups that is also fighting for a similar cross in Manipur. So this is the second one and the third one that we need to consider is Prepak. So Prepak is also another important group. So all these three groups together are fighting for a civil similar cost within the region of Manipur. So where are these people from the liberation people's liberation army drawn from so they are basically drawn from the one of the community and that is the Meitei community so these people want to make sure that they again have a successionist policy and what they basically believe in is the guerrilla warfare so they are fighting the Indian armed forces by a guerrilla warfare and these guerrilla forces fight the Indian armed forces basically to make sure that they are away staying away from India and one of the other important important armed insurgent groups is this Prepak. So what they again want is an independent homeland. So they are again fighting for their independent homeland in the region of Manipur. So all these three groups are a major barrier for the internal security forces where it is in the region of Manipur. So kindly remember all these facts important from the internal security perspective. And what is the major thing of also Prepak? Apart from the homeland thing, what it also wants to do is it wants to expel all the outsiders. So there are people who are not part of this particular region, right? They would have trans they would have migrated to this particular region. So what it also demands is that it wants to expel all these people who have come to this particular area of Manipur and that is it wants to expel all these people who have I staying in this particular area of Manipur. So this is all we will have to understand with respect to this article. So moving on, let's look into the next article. So in this article what we will be discussing is about one of the important bridges and that is to do with the Mokibil 
bridge so what we will have to understand is certain factual data so let's focus on all these factual data that is important so when it comes to the importance of this it is a combined road and railway bridge over the Brahmaputra River in Assam between Demaji district as well as the Dibrugad district so where is it found it is across Brahmaputra River in Assam so this is the first important point from the prelims perspective so upon its expected completion at the end of 2018 the 4.94 kilometer bridge work which was started in the year 2002 would be the longest rail come road bridge in India so this can be another likely important pop-up in your prelims examination so this bogey bill is the fourth railroad bridge on the Brahmaputra River and bogey bill bridge connects the north south of the river Brahmaputra and is situated in the eastern region of the Arunachal Pradesh and Assam the foundation stone for bogey bill bridge was laid by former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee in 2002 and built at an estimated cost of 4857 crore this bogey bridge is the second largest in India so remember all these three important facts and why was a Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee's name pop up because we recently had Atal Bihari G passing away so this can also be asked in this particular framework so what is the significance of this so when we look into the significance one of the most important point will be from the strategic perspective so what is this from the strategic perspective so since it is situated in the region of Arunachal Pradesh what we would be able to do is we would be able to move all our troops and we would be able to provide arms and ammunition and the supply to the border areas in the region of Arunachal Pradesh so in case we have a quite tussle with China or there is a possible tussle or a skirmish along the borders we would be able to move our troops as well as provide them arms and ammunitions immediately and in a much faster and an effective way and this bridge is located just over 20 kilometer from Assam Arunachal Pradesh border and is thus expected to act as an alternative to the Kolia Bombrov Setu Tezpur in providing connectivity to nearly 5 million people residing in Upper Assam as well as Arunachal Pradesh and apart from this this will also save a lot of time both in terms of road and travel so this becomes the third important significant aspect as of now a train from Arunachal Pradesh to Assam's Dibugar means a detour of about 500 kilometers via Gauhati but with Bogibil bridge the train journey will be less than 100 kilometers so this will tame, uh, save a lot of time as well as money as well as the travel time to meet a particular destination so this is all we will have to understand with reference to this article so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article that we are speaking about is the solar mamas so who are these solar mamas so these are nothing but the rural women solar engineers so the solar mamas are nothing but the rural solar engineers so what are these people doing so these people are basically employed in the solar sector and they'll be helping in advancing the solar regime so what do I mean by it so all these people especially people from African region are coming up to this particular region of Rajasthan and that is Tilonoi so these people are coming up to this particular region and they are learning a lot of economic upgradation schemes and that will help them in the empowerment and when they are empowered what they'll be able to have is a sustained life for themselves so what is the functions that they are performing in this particular program so they are actually trained to perform certain fabrications install use repair as well as maintain solar lanterns and household solar lighting system in their villages so what we are doing indirectly we are providing them the channels of empowerment so they'll be able to perform their lives much better than what they were doing previously so the women are also trained in solar electrification and other entrepreneurial skills such as beekeeping as well as tailing so under the government of India supported programs with the African countries as well as other countries for example the Latin American countries this college in Rajasthan that is situated in Tilonia has been promoting and training rural women solar engineers from Africa in household solar lighting as well as systems a barefoot women vocational training college in Zanzibar islands has also been opened on a similar platform and other countries in Africa has also been set up for imparting solar electrification skills as well as distributing solar kits they'll replicate the model in the villages by installing solar lanterns and panels and train the women in their communities for the electrification 
of their homes so what we will have to understand in this particular case is what is this barefoot college all about so this barefoot college was one of the programs that was initiated in the year 1972 in the region of Rajasthan and that is in Thelonia. So this was one of the programs that was initiated by Bunker Roy. So he was one of the important persons who came about bringing a large scale transformation. So this barefoot college is one of the voluntary organizations that will help all the women to evolve their lives. How is that they're evolving their lives? Because these people would be taught a number of empowerment skills in the field of education or in the field of skill development or in the field of women empowerment and electrification that these people are taught about and why is this being done so that they are able to uplift their lives especially in terms of the rural people and what we need to understand is that this Thelonia is in the region of Ajmer district in the region of Rajasthan. So this can be a potential question from the prelims perspective. So what is the most important program is that this particular program has been able to train almost about 15,000 women in the various skills and this will involve basically training in solar energy applications in the barefoot college latest initiative and this was launched in the year 2005 and is now supported by the ministry of external affairs it caters to two groups of people that is one you have people within india and people outside india so it is empowerment of the rural women right so all that it does is it will cater to two sections one is for the people within india and outside india and that will involve the latin american countries and also other parts of asia pacific islands as well as african countries so this is what we need to understand with reference to this article so what is the main agenda of this it is basically nothing but empowerment of women so this can be used in your essay as well as in social issues and this can also act as one of the models for evolving the life of a woman so use this and remember this Thelonia solar mama model so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article that we are speaking about is Vaishnava Janato so this can be an important article from GS perspective that is GS paper 1 in terms of the culture so this can be asked in the prelims perspective so it is one of the most popular Hindu bhajans written in the 15th century by the poet Narsin Mehta in the Gujarati language so kindly remember this from the prelims perspective so this bhajan was included in the Mahatma Gandhi's daily prayer so this bhajan speak about the life's ideals and mentality of a Vaishnava Jana the one who is following the principles of the Vaishnavism and who is a disciple of of Vaishnav. So what it basically goes on to speak about is any person who is practicing these janas or these form of ethos and values, he would want to understand the feelings of the others. He would want to know what are people going through, what are the pain of other people so in case he recognizes that there are certain pain there is grief in another person's life what we would be able to do is understand all these miseries and then provide them certain help and this help should be in the form of sympathy and compathy and not in the form of self pride so in case you realize that people are in grief in case people are in pain and people are in misery what we need to understand is we need to be compassionate towards them and in case we are compassionate what we will be able to understand is the ideals of the Vaishnava Jana and this should not take the form of pride but instead it should be in the form of sympathy and it further goes on to say that we need to understand what people's life are what is their entire world we cannot be criticizing people all the time we cannot catcalling them we do not ridicule them all the time and we always need to keep a check on our words we need not have to be abusive because what we need is the internal manifestation of pure thoughts so he speaks further that there should be equality in the society we should respect the women because all women are like mothers and what we need to make sure is in case there is wealth which is not ours we should not be considering these aspects so there should be what is called as need but not greed is what this particular Vaishnava Janato all about for 
which what he says is that we need to keep our thoughts in control we need to give away the anger and what we need to make sure is we need to forsake the greed what we need is the basic amount and that is the need and whatever rest greed is there that should be forsaken is what this particular Vaishnava Janato all about so with reference to this what is being said is that there are certain screenings that will be done say for example a film festival screening about 15 archival films of Mahatma Gandhi will be held and also for the children the INB ministry is exploring making an animation film on Mahatma Gandhi's teaching and a competition of short films is also planned by the ministry so this is be planned in the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi on October 2nd but this is important from the perspective of Vaishnava Janato and this can be a potential question or a prospective question in the prelims examination so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article we are speaking about is in reference to the West Bengal infrastructure so what is the most important point is the recently we have had one of the bridge that collapsed and that is the Majerhat bridge so this was a key connector between the south as well as southwestern Kolkata and this collapse actually killing about three percent and leaving about 20 in danger so what is the problem why are the bridges falling is what we need to understand with respect to this article so when we look into the article what it goes on to say is that there are more than 20 bridges and these 20 bridges have outlived their time so because they are outlived their time that is the major problem and because every bridge that is there will be given a particular time so they'll have a span with respect to the living time of this particular bridge but what this particular article goes on to say is that there are about 20 bridges and all these 20 bridges have outlived their lifespan and that's the most important point we need to consider and apart from this what it goes on to say is many of the bridges that were built were built in the colonial era and these bridges that were built in the colonial era certain statistics and certain data is not available so the people in case they would want to bring about a change or they would want to strengthen this particular bridge they do not have relevant data or the statistics so because they were built in the colonial era because they do not have the data and statistics the implementation or the strengthening of this particular program is becoming a tedious issue and that is the second point with respect to why the bridges are falling and apart from this what we also need to do is that there have been a number of tenders that have been raised but the problem is the tenders are raised and then the problem is the implementation bit there are number of tenders that have been raised with respect to these things for the implementation purposes but when it comes to the actual implementation that is not happening and that is where the suffering is taking place because the public works department which is supposed to enforce all these things is not working in tandem that's the major problem that we are considering and apart from this all the adequate measures that were supposed to be taken by these local administration people are also not being taken that is because these structures have do not have the data as we discussed in the colonial era problem so these are some of the things as to why the bridges are falling so what are the concerns so when we look into the concerns one of the most important point that we need to condition is the apathy so what do we mean by it so there is constant state of apathy towards the design so when there is a particular design how is that this particular design is done what is the structure how long will it be able to sustain this move what is the weight it will be able to take on all these things is not taken into the picture so there is constant state of apathy from the local administration regarding the design structure as well as the implementation purposes and regarding data collection so the first concern that we understand is this collapse that is actually is a reflection of the thought of the local administration or people who were supposed to take care of this particular bridge why because they do not have a clear-cut idea of the design as well as the maintenance of this particular bridge and apart from this what is also the problem is the government has time and again ignored the warnings so even in this particular case in the Mamata Banerjee government there were certain warnings that were given to the government but the government has failed to understand these warnings and take this very seriously so time and again warnings were given to these administrative people especially the Mamata Banerjee government but these warnings were not taken up seriously and this has turned this into a precarious situation and apart from this what we also see is the blame game 
so what happens in this particular case is now we have the Mamata Banerjee government so what happens in this particular case is there is a constant blame game so earlier what they say, do is they say that this is the program of the CPIM so this is a program and design was approved by the CPIM government so that is why this has resulted in the death of so many people that is why bridge has collapsed so what happens in this particular case is the governments that is the present government instead of taking the responsibility what it has constantly done is it has gone about blame gaming the earlier governments that are there so these are the possible concerns now the problem that we need to understand is who is responsible for all this yes we did see that why is the bridge is falling what they did see what is the concerns but the problem is who is responsible so when we look into that part what happens happens is that there are multiple agencies currently which are looking into these structures one such as the public works department then you have the Kolkata Metro Development Authority then you have the irrigation department then you have the Kolkata Port Trust as well as the railways so there are multiple resources and multiple departments that are involved in sustaining this particular program and maintaining the infrastructure but the problem is we cannot hold a single party that is currently accountable so whom are we supposed to blame for this particular game is the problem all about so there is no single person single department or a single organization where we would be able to say that this is an organization that is supposed to be responsible why because number of organizations are involved in this particular program so what is the government currently doing and how is that the people will be changing this particular operations for which the state government has set up the bridge inspection and the monitoring committee under the public works department the irrigation as well as the KMWA so these committees will be engaged in the society audit of the bridges the state government has also planned the plying of heavy vehicles as well as 20 wheeler trucks on the bridges and flyovers of the city and the government has also urged the Joka BBD bag metro project being carried out in the vicinity of the Macherhead bridge to suspend work till the inquiry committee which is headed by the chief secretary completes its investigation so this is a temporary provision the government has taken however what we need to have is a long term plan as well so what I would request you guys is just put it on the comment section what could be the possible way what are the long term solutions that the government should be taking up in order to avoid all these possible issues for which we will be discussing day after tomorrow but we would want to take up your suggestions as well so type in all your suggestions with respect to the long term programs how the government every state government as well as central government would be able to stop the bridge collapses that have been taking place in the number of cities so put it on your comment section and whatever discussions we'll be having it shortly so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says who says 34 percent of india not active enough so when we look into this particular article this is what the world health organization has said with respect to the states of inactivity so what it goes on to say is globally about one in every four adults is not leading a physically active lifestyle and this is in terms of the adult life food so what they say is an adult who does not undergo at least two point hours of moderate intensity or at least 1.25 hours of vigorous intensity physical activity per week is considered to be physically inactive so this can be a likely question in the prelims examination that is 2.5 hours or 1.25 hours in case they are not engaging them on a weekly basis then it means that these people are physically inactive and this is according to the World Health Organization so what does this particular report go about speaking so it has considered all those adults that is from the age group of 80 so what it has gone on to say is that there are number of countries let's say for example physical inactivity is also high in high income nations in some cases the inactivity is more than double than in the lower income countries so what does it mean let's take for example the Kuwait in this particular case so and let's take for example the Togo so Kuwait is a much advanced country but what we see in this particular case is it is Kuwait which is facing a lot of physical inactivity rather than the lower developing countries so you have a number of countries let's say for example the Kuwait or you consider Saudi Arabia Arabia so you consider this Iraq all these nations are comparatively on a much better phase but there is a physical inactivity that is being linked to this when you consider the United States of America almost about 
forty percent of the people are in the problem area, and we can consider the United Kingdom about thirty six percent are in a problem area. So, what is the physical inactivity for all these people? It is about forty percent and thirty six percent for the respective countries. So, when it comes to India, it says. 34% of the indians are physically inactive so what is the problem right now so when we look into the problems what this can be resultant is that these people will suffer from a number of diseases let's say for example a cardiovascular issue so when there is no proper organization and there is no control over the body and physical activity this can result in the cardiovascular diseases or this can also result in the type 2 diabetes so what is requested by the world health organization is that there needs to be a constant physical activity at least 2.5 hours or 1.5 hours of intensical physical activity that we require every week is what the world health organization has said so this is what this article all about so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article speaks about one of the important species and that is bonnet head so this is one of the important points from the prelims perspective so let's understand this article so what it says is it says the iucn status of the bonnet omnivorous shark is iucn is least concern and where exactly is it found it is very abundant small hammerhead that is found in the shallow estuaries as well as bay on the atlantic as well as pacific ocean coast of the americas as well as in the gulf of mexico so what is a core area so the core area is that these bonnet head sharks which were initially assumed to be strict carnivorous are not actually carnivorous but they are omnivorous that is they consume both plants in the form of sea grass as well as they have certain animals as well that is in the form of crustaceans the crabs as well as fishes so they are not carnivorous but instead they are omnivorous sharks which live on grass as well as other crustaceans as well as fish and most important point is they they are able to digest all the sea grass because they have a certain mechanism in their body they have a certain digestion process and because they have certain acidic contents in their stomach they are easily able to ingest as well as digest the sea grass that is present within this particular environment what we will also be discussing is last sunday i came up with one of the important articles and that is to do with the brown antelid deer or what is also called as sangai so what i had also told was the iucn state was critically endangered i'm sorry for the miss interpretation but the iucn status for the same is the endangered so what i would also request you guys is that kindly refer the iucn official website why because there have been changes and these changes take place every now and then and when their particular newspaper article is also given it may also give this particular status in terms of the region so what we will also have to focus is that we are not sticking only with reference to that article but we will be sticking with reference to the iucn official website what i did a mistake was in terms of looking only in terms of that article that was published in the hindu but i would request you guys to kindly look into the iucn official website so that we do not commit such mistakes in the future so the iucn status for brown antelid deer is not critically endangered it is endangered so please visit the iucn website in order to get the iucn status for the same so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says it is about the global commission call for controlling the climate change so what we need to understand in this particular case is that there was one of the reports that was released by the global commission on the economy climate and it said that in case we are able to initiate bold action this could result in as much as 30 trillion gain by 2030 with businesses conducted as usual this is one of the important think tanks so what this particular organization or this particular group does is it looks into economy as well as the climate change so it looks into two important aspects of business as well as the climate change so what it examines is it looks into number of programs and the schemes that different companies different organizations different countries has taken so that they are able to achieve the economic growth as well as assume how climate change can be reduced so this think tank organization is one of those think tank organizations which is working in improving the 
environment how it studies all important organizations it studies important countries and see how businesses and the country growth can be seen in spite of reducing the risk that is posed by the climate change that is what this organization as a whole will see and what this organization as a structure has is it has all the people from the important governments and it also has people from the finance ministry so it will have the people from the government min government as well as from the finance ministry and also people from economics as well as business so these people will be all employed in this organization so that they would be able to provide suitable feedback in order to bring about a change in this particular paradigm and this was established in the year 2013 so that they could bring about a change with respect to those things that are there with respect to the growth as well as the climate change so what this commission has gone about saying is that this mission has said that in case we are able to bring about certain changes and controlling and curbing the climate change will be a benefit so in case we are able to overcome and assume all these balances then we would be able to make sure that 65 million new low carbon generation jobs as well as we would be able to avoid 7 lakh deaths which are fueled by pollution this is one of the important things that this particular organization has said so the global commission calls on governments business finance leaders to urgently prioritize actions on four fronts over the next 2 to 3 years what has it said it has said ramp up efforts on carbon pricing and move to mandatory disclosure of climate related financial risk accelerate investment in the sustainable infrastructure harness the power of the private sector and unleash innovation and build a people centered approach that shares the gain equitably and ensures that the transition is in just and this is requested all the government and the businesses to bring about a change so that we are able to take on the climate change so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article says eight avian species go extinct so what are these species about one is the spix macco it is a type of parrot which was last sighted in wild in 2000 and then we have is the alugus foliage gleaner then the cryptic tree hunter then the permabu pygmy owl then we have is the glaucus macco and poor uli which is also called as the black fist honey creeper so this particular survey was done by the statistical analysis by the bird life international and what it has also said is that the international union for conservation of natural red list access that more than 26000 of the world species were under severe threat what is the major problem or the causes that is because of the deforestation so number of these birds that are there currently are in the region of south america as well as in the brazil areas nearly 4 out of these 8 extinct birds are in the region of brazil and because of massive deforestation and conversion of forest area into industrial area as well as farmland that has resulted into the extinction of this particular birds so this is what we need to understand from the prelims examination so kindly visit the byju cna look into the practice questions both prelims as well as mains write all the answers on the comment section so that we can evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same so this is it for today thank you so much all the best